This is Twit. And now, on to headlines. Yes. Yeah, so <laughs> the one that's got us all scratching our heads, this kind of mixed messaging we're getting in the, in the media, both popular and otherwise, about the Russian doomsday machine in orbit, right. which <laughs> is not that at all. So give us the uh, the download on this. Yeah, this is this is one. I know it's not just a, a Tarek story. When people who are not <laughs> even like in my realm, like the people that are that, that like my friends, <laughs> call me to ask me about something. But yeah, this week we got confirmation that Russia is building a new anti satellite weapon. Um, that it it may involve nuclear something of somehow, uh, you know, we, uh, we're not sure what that means, but, but this is a really weird one because uh, earlier this week, um, uh, a, a member of the house, uh, uh, you know, called on the, the white house to declassify uh, this, the, the knowledge about this, this program uh, because they wanted to be discussing it, you know, in, in Congress and they had special meetings uh, and whatnot. And it caused a, like a big, um, uh, I don't want to say like a storm or like an uproar. As, but, as Bugs Bunny would say, a, f a furore. A f yeah. And, uh, uh, you know, in, in the Capitol where they were just, everyone was abuzz with what is this? In fact, someone reached out to me to say they were really freaked out about it. And like, what is it? What could it be? Um, and, it, and it was confirmed uh, to the point that it can be because it's still a classified, apparently like super classified uh, uh, uh like the fact that we know it, uh, that Russia is building an, an, an anti-satellite program. Uh, it's not apparently in space at this moment. Uh, so it's a capability that they don't have right now. Uh, in fact, um, a White House spokesman said yesterday that there is no immediate threat to, uh, uh, to everyone on earth or, or, or to it. But from what we can in, infer, it is some sort of anti-satellite weapon that would knock out other satellites in space. So things like uh, uh, your GPS, your communications network, that sort of stuff, stuff that we rely on, uh, uh, you know, every day. There is supposedly, uh, and of course I can't confirm this because, you know, we, we didn't have the, um, uh, the confirmation, some kind of nuclear angle, you know, maybe it's nuclear powered, maybe it's something else. We don't know, uh, and we're going to have to see where where this develops. But it's it's very interesting because if it's an actual weapon uh, to be deployed in space, that does run counter to the 1967 Outer Space uh, a Peaceful Uses of Outer Space Treaty, uh, which you know then calls into question if that's even valid or if people can be held accountable to that at all. Uh, the countries that, that that sign on to it, and uh, and so we'll have to see like what the next steps is in, in, in all of these discussions. But it, it's a really weird one. This whole situation, Rod, um, and you know we've seen a rise in anti satellite tests, not just uh, with Russia, but you know we've, China has 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 done one. India has done one recently. There's a a rise for hypersonic missiles and missile defense. So this seems to be something else that we have to keep an eye on. Um, right. But and I'll, I'll I'll end with this in the White House briefing uh, yesterday as we're recording this it did come up very clearly that they 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 said that there is a risk uh, these types of anti satellite weapons can pose a risk not just to satellites in orbit but to any astronauts that are in orbit as well because they need the same systems to 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 work so uh, I was surprised to hear the mention of astronauts in that briefing but it's there and so that is like another measure of how important it is to keep track and figure out what's going on with this stuff. Well, what's kind of frustrating, a little scary about this is, you, you know, we're we're kind of led, at least by the the press accounts I've been reading, to believe this is some kind of kinetic weapon. But then there was, of course, the mention of of some kind of nuclear aspect. So if this is a limited yield electromagnetic pulse weapon, I mean, can you do that in orbit without affecting ground systems? And if you do affect ground systems, how how big a deal is it? And of course, this has been you know, the subject to tons and tons of end of times fiction and so forth. And I don't want to go there, but it is a question people are asking. And I guess we're not going to know till we know. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Well, let's hope we don't have to find out, you know, the, 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 the hard way where, where these are actually being demonstrated in space because you knock out some satellites, there's a lot of satellites up there. And, you know, yeah. while we, we say there's a lot of space, eventually, you know, uh, as we saw with Cosmos and Iridium, they can hit each other and cause lots and lots of, uh, of damage and debris and just, you know, it'll, it'll affect how we access space in the future. So I'm trying not to think of worst case scenarios for all this right now. What we know is that there's a weapon that's being developed that's not in space. It's not like in, in practical use right now. Mm -hmm. um, we don't know the specifics of it. A lot of it is classified. The fact that we even know it 
is supposedly classified, like how we know it and whatnot. Um, and so, uh, so we'll have to just see what gets to classified in the near future, what gets revealed, um, and, um, uh, and what the U S might develop to address this kind of a thing. Well, or has already developed, and this is complete spitballing on my part. It has nothing to do with their interview with, with Pam Melbury later. It has nothing to do with anything I've read with NASA, but what country currently has the control over the most steerable active space assets? It's the U.S. because any Starlink satellite can be steered wherever you want to take it within a certain orbital band. Just saying. And, <laughs> you know, they're, oh they were, they're kinetic in nature. All right. But moving on small. To, to more positive things. Oh, they're small, but they're big yeah. enough. You know, something the size of a kitchen table could put a real dent in your, uh, your satellite. Uh, private Moonlander lifts off. Intuitive Machines is on the way. That's right. That's right. Uh, uh, this is a big success for this week. Uh, SpaceX. SpaceX had a triple, a triple play within 23 hours. They launched three different missions, and this was the first of those three. Uh, they launched the Odysseus. Uh, Nova Sea Moon Lander uh, on the IM-1 mission for Intuitive Machines. That's a private company um, that is building uh, these private spacecraft to take uh, payloads for NASA as well as for other customers uh, to the moon. Uh, launched uh, the wee hours uh, on Valentine's Day. Um, and uh, actually, no, it launched on the day after Valentine's Day. So, um, but... Uh, uh, but it, it seems like it's doing well. And this is part of a $118 million contract that Intuitive Machines has with NASA as part of the co uh, commercial uh, lunar payload services uh, uh, program, which is this whole partnership uh, with companies to build uh, commercial landers that the NASA either uh, uh, teams up with to get some space on or, uh, or buys the whole thing outright, uh, to land, uh, a rover, uh, a payload package, et cetera. For this mission, uh, they're going to study plume interactions, uh, between the thrusters so they can understand what that works. There's some uh, experiments for NASA as well as, uh, there's a Jeff, uh, Coombs art installation on, uh, on this one too, uh, that's going to stay on the moon, uh, forever, uh, as part of, um, uh, uh that, that, that network and it's really exciting because it all it seemed to go uh perfectly and if everything continues to go well uh it it will land we're hearing like in the afternoon of february 22nd so not very long uh to get to the moon only about a uh, about a just over a week or so to get there as opposed to some of the the, the recent ones and you know we talked about the astrobotic um, launch of peregrine uh, which unfortunately did not manage to land on the moon this one is also aimed at the south pole it's going to land in a um a crater that nasa's already flagged um in that region uh, again as part of the agency's goal to get astronauts there in the next two years all right. And uh, another mission we're going to talk about, which has been a tremendous success, but maybe nearing an end. But but I can't look at this as a downer because of how astonishing it's been. And that's Voyager 1. And before we, we hear your, your take on this, I just want to remind people, this has been flying for 45 plus years. Mm -hmm. It's a machine that was designed with late 60s technology, flown in the late 70s. Uh, and since that time, and since leaving the solar system, let's just remember this thing is still running. You know, it records data on reel to reel tape <laughs> with a big tape player like your your grandfather had in his old Chevy, like an eight track. Uh, and it's just astonishing that this I mean, just the fact that that tape has managed to maintain its integrity being dragged back and forth over a magnetic head all these years, along with everything else you have to do. Plus maintaining thrusters and guidance systems and internal temperatures and all this stuff with a little couple pellets of plutonium that are generating what's left of the amount of heat that they can because they're nearing their half life. Uh, it's just incredible. Yeah, yeah, and and just for for perspective, Voyager One launched on uh on September fifth, nineteen seventy seven. So I am about like a right. few months older. If anyone wants to do the math, <laughs> then then Voyager one, um, and uh, and now here it is out in interstellar space. And what what happened um, at the end actually of last year, NASA uh, sent out an alert to say that that Voyager one has um, you know has has a problem. Basically, it has the computer issue uh, with its uh, flight data system. It's not uh, it had two. It had a backup system, but the backup went offline in 1981. So decades ago, it's been running on this this primary one uh, since then. 
and uh, and the the system is not kind of talking correctly with another another vital system. It's telemetry modulation needed. This thing called a TMU, and um, and so it can't send any science or engineering data back to Earth. And actually, it, it had a hiccup in December, and they had to reestablish contact uh, with 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 the the spacecraft. And so NASA still hasn't been able to regain full functionality uh, with the spacecraft and they're hoping that they can but but this it just might be uh, a, an issue where you know the the spacecraft is 47 years old and maybe it it, it can't bounce back from this uh, when it's it's so far away it takes forever you know it's like a hundred and uh, it's just 149 uh, let's see hmm I'm trying to try to do the math because it's 162 AUs, astronomical units, from our planet. And one astronomical unit is the distance between the Earth and the, the sun. So 162 times that, <laughs> that's how far. Yeah, far I was going to say it's a lot more than a couple <laughs> of AU. Yeah. yeah. It's many billions uh, at this so, point. So, the, the, you know, the NASA is working on it. Uh, you know, it's not dead, which I think is the important takeaway. Uh, and if you're going to be really sad about Voyager 1, uh, Voyager 2 is still going strong launched in the same year and actually launched before Voyager one. And, uh, and it's, it's, it's off on a different part of, um, I believe interstellar space doing its own thing. So they will at least have that, um, and, uh, be able to try to see how long they can keep that one going. But I tell you, Voyager one has been one of those success stories that you just, you just, you, 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 you're surprised it's still going. And then you're surprised, you know, when it's when it goes offline, if it if it's going to do. But we're going to knock on wood that uh, that uh, the folks at NASA and that JPL can uh, 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 turn this one around and, and get it talking to the right systems again. Well, and what a success story. And I'll just remind people, I bring this up every time we talk about Voyager. But, you know, this program has been besides being an incredible icon of longevity and reliability, it's operating on a few million dollars a year, well less than ten million dollars, I believe, mm -hmm. or, or maybe maybe closer to eighteen. But it's a couple of, of old Sun workstations on a couple of banquet tables tucked away in a corner of JPL. This isn't a big thing at Mission Control. It does take dish time for the Deep Space Network, but once that those command strings go back and forth, and we're talking about something that's fifteen point two billion with a B miles away right now. Yeah. So, you know, you're sending, you're flinging signals way out into the ether and looking for this flickering uh, handful of watts signal being transmitted back when it, when it is, but it's being run on an absolute shoestring and has been for a couple of decades. So this is, it's something that will certainly mourn, but it has fulfilled its its destiny many times over. Hey, if you enjoyed this clip, be sure to check out This Week in Space. You can find us on your favorite podcast app or see the link in the description below. See you there.